Hi everybody, I'm Kevin Meehan and I'm the program director at Ambler Farm. Now, we're gonna give you some tips on how to build projects, to build projects out of wood. And this whole idea really came out of a partnership with Ambler Farm in Wilton, Connecticut and Lachat Farm in Weston, Connecticut. So we hope that you'll find this very helpful and there's gonna be more information that's attached on our websites regarding building a birdhouse. Now, when I first started building, which was 20 something years ago, we didn't have YouTube. We didn't have videos to learn from. And I remember in those days that I would actually watch this old house and I would get the fine home building magazine and learn by reading. The, the truth is right now, you can learn how to do anything on YouTube. It's absolutely amazing. And it's changed the way people do projects at home. So between the two farms, we had this idea of people building birdhouses. Now, this is a great project for everybody being stuck at home right now. And the truth is, just looking at all the materials that I have at the farm, you probably have a smaller pile, but everybody's got stuff left over from little projects that have been done at home. So you can find the scraps to build a birdhouse. Now, if I were building a birdhouse, this is how I generally would approach it. I'd go on Pinterest. I'd look at all the pictures. I'd get a whole bunch of ideas. Then I'd look at all the materials I have left over from other projects and try and think, okay, which of those materials is gonna work with the project idea that I love? Now, the key to learning how to build is you gotta be willing to make mistakes. Whatever you make, it is not gonna be perfect the first time. Now, I'm a, I would call myself a good builder. I would not call myself a carpenter. I have way too much respect for what carpenters do. But the reason I'm a good builder at this point is because I've made a whole bunch of mistakes. And that is the best way to learn by making mistakes because they're memorable. Now, of course you want to bear in mind safety is the biggest key with everything that you're doing. But before we talk about woodworking, let's just talk about crafts or projects in general. And I'm going to give you some feedback from my experiences of 20 something years working with kids from preschool all the way to, to college. If you are using a hot glue gun, they're very forgiving, they're great, they're easy. You get immediate results when you're working with kids. So as I talk about all the building ideas, I'm gonna frame them around you doing them with your kids. Truth is, if you have building experience, you don't need to watch this video. You should watch the videos on YouTube and just pick the project that you're interested in. But if you're working with kids, you got two types of glue guns. You've got the low temp and the high temp. You should be using low temp with children. Don't use high temp. It's overkill. It's way too hot. Every once in a while with low temp, you're gonna get some hot glue on your finger. It's gonna hurt, but they're gonna be okay. You don't wanna use the high temp hot glue gun. Any project that you build with kids, if you put googly eyes on it, you brought it to life, it's a home run. Even if it doesn't look like anything, you put eyes on it, now you've got something. So a package of googly eyes is your go-to in any kind of craft kit that you have. No matter what you're making, it's a great opportunity for kids to color it. And that's how they can be involved. Now, this, I built projects with kids that might be the same for a kid going into first grade and a kid going into seventh grade. For the seventh graders, there's more hands-on, there's more building. And for the younger kids going into first grade, there might be more coloring. Either way, they're going to own the project. It's theirs, they made it, they're proud of it. The key is with the younger kids that you give them more support. Now, whatever project you're building with the kids, if you're building a woodworking project and you're working with children, they are not gonna have the attention span that you do for the project. So you break it up. In other words, I might cut out a piece and know that I need two of them if I'm building the sides of a birdhouse. So if I'm working with a very young child, they're gonna come in and they're gonna trace that piece onto my next piece of wood and then I might cut it out. If I'm going to be hammering it together with nails, I'm gonna start the nails till they're almost done, and then I'm gonna hold my hands apart while they hammer in the rest, and they're gonna feel like they own that portion of it. So you've gotta think about how to set them up, and you do a lot of behind the scenes work in order to work with their short attention span. So no matter what you're doing, whether it's painting and wood wood, you might need to prime it first. Spray paint is great. Um, but having the kids color it is a way to engage them more in the project. Goggles are great, and goggles are great for a couple of reasons. The first reason they're not great, I've never really worked with nails and had a nail 
um, fly off. It can, but the best reason to have goggles on is really because of this. And this is the sandpaper. Now, sandpaper is a great way for your kids to spend 20 or 30 minutes or longer sanding every part of the birdhouse that you're working on. They actually really enjoy it and they can see the difference as they're using it. It's very manageable for every age group. However, sandpaper creates the sawdust. And this is the reason why you would wanna use goggles with the kids or oversee them very carefully. It sounds silly, but out of all the tools that I'm using, this is the one that I'm gonna watch the most with kids because I don't want them to rub and to get the, the sawdust in their eye. It's very annoying. Now, let's just talk about some tools for a minute. I'm gonna talk about four saws. So it depends on the age group of your child and your comfort level, which one you would use for which project. So this is a jigsaw. Now, this is a corded jigsaw. So if I have the idea of working with my kids over the next couple of weeks, months on projects that might come up, woodworking projects, I tend to go with cordless tools. They have less power, but they're easier to use and they're more mobile. You can use them in different areas. And I love just taking off the battery and putting it back on. I just find that these are more friendly to working with kids. And generally I would use these tools with my eighth graders and higher. Um, although obviously you know your own child and you make that decision. Now, so four saws here. This is the jigsaw. This is a coping saw actually without the blade. I apologize for that, but there's a very small blade that would go in here. That's called a coping saw. This is a hand saw. It's a short hand saw. It's a cross cutting saw, which means you're cutting across the grain. And this is a circular saw. And this is a battery charged circular saw as well. Now, out of these four saws, which one would be the safest one to use with children? It's actually gonna be this one. It's the coping saw. The teeth are incredibly tiny. And when you use the coping saw, you can actually hold it this way to saw. I've used this with fifth graders over many years, never had uh, any kind of injury. The key is when you're using a coping saw and you are using it on a piece of wood, you wanna be sure that the wood is held down. I generally use a vise, but clamps are great to use as well so that that's stable. When you're using any kind of saw, the hand that is holding the saw, that's not the one that's gonna get hurt. It's gonna be the other hand. So you're always watching the placement of where your child puts their other hand. Again, depending on the age level of the child that you're working with. Now, when I use clamps on any material, you gotta remember this, you're gonna clamp it hard and you're actually gonna make an impression with the clamp. So what I will often do is I will put another board on top like that and then I would clamp to it like that. Now I'm gonna make an impression on this top board but the pressure is gonna be distributed across the board. I'm not gonna leave an impression on that board. Now, if you're making a birdhouse, I don't think the birds care about the impression. Don't stress about that. Now, other parts, let's go back to the saws. The handsaw. Whenever you're using a handsaw, you wanna make sure that your first cut is a pull towards you and then a push. Again, you're watching where your other saw is. It's not about speed and it's not about pressing hard. But I would say in this list, I would say that this is my second safest tool. And that is my jigsaw. And here's why. When you use a jigsaw, both hands are here. I'm not, my hands are nowhere near that blade. And if I have um, a high school kid who's first learning how to use it, I would put my hands on top of it at the same time. Again, you're going by your child, or these might actually be good instructions just for you and the tools that you wanna have in your home. The circular saw, unless I have a highly skilled high school student, I don't let anybody use it. Circular saw will sometimes kick depending on your pressure and it will pull out. Now, in using all of these saws, if you're gonna use them, go to YouTube. You'll see lots of different videos. Here's the key about YouTube. 
you should watch it, watch the video first on your own. And here's why. Some of the best teachers I ha I've had have been the teachers in the trades. So three guys who actually weren't teachers at all, but they're explaining how to use things. So they were the best teachers. However, if you're watching a video on YouTube and you're watching a tradesperson, sometimes they might not be using the language that you would want to be used in front of your child. So you would want to be sure to watch those videos first. Okay, so you've got four saws and you can go to YouTube to see safety and how to use them all. And I would recommend that. Now, when you're building birdhouses, because that's really our whole idea of making this video, to build birdhouses, they're really two styles. Now, if this bird looks like a bat, that's because it's a bat. This actually was a bat house. But what I liked about this is that as long as you made the box wider, this is the style for a birdhouse. Now, the other kind of birdhouse that you would see Actually, in a bat house, by the way, the bat goes underneath, and you actually want to rough up the surface on the inside because the bat will crawl up into the house. Go on YouTube, you'll see lots of different ways to build bat houses. Now, this is one style of house. We'll call it a bird house if the box was wider, and of course, you had that circular hole right there. Now, the other style would be your typical house that looks like this, it comes to a point. Now, I actually think that this in some ways is easier and in some ways more difficult. The challenge is this, you're gonna have to make an angle there on that cut. Now, if you're making this at home, you might not have the equipment or the experience to actually make that cut. If I wanted to make that cut, I would mark my board. I would determine my angle and I might mark it. Now, let's say I only wanted my board to be 10 inches long. I would mark my board. Now, this is my favorite tool, and it is called a speed square. I'm gonna have to come back to my speed square. Very handy for using. Not here. Here's my speed square now. Okay, so if I've made my, my mark, and let's say I wanted it to be, I was going to make it that wide, I might draw a line there. Now, as I put that underneath my saw, which might be this saw here, and I would angle it, I wouldn't cut this to a short piece. I would leave it long, cut the angle so my hands are away from the saw blade, and then I would cut it along that line when, it's the, when I've already made my angle cut and I'm happy with it. And I would just make sure I measure from that point all the way to here. It's just another way to keep your hands away from the blade. Um, and again, watch the safety videos on all of these materials. Now, a couple of different things. When you are going to fasten your pieces, it's always a great idea to use glue. You don't have to use glue. Now you're gonna find different pieces of wood that are in your storage area. This is a piece of pine, this is a piece of cedar. Now the cedar is softer than pine. When I put a screw into the cedar, there's a very good chance that it's not going to break off. If I put it into the pine, if I'm going Along the grain, there's a very good chance if I put a screw right there, that this piece is gonna break off. So, what do we do about that? Well, why don't we try it for a minute? Just to see if it does break. I'm gonna go right to the edge. Now, I'm gonna move it off my table. Now, it didn't actually go down all the way because it's not pulling into anything at this moment. That didn't split. But notice how my screw is up a bit. Now, you can order these, or you might even have one. This is called a countersink bit. Now, you'll notice this is going to make the hole, and then this 
is sort of flanging out. So let's watch that for a minute. And you'll see that it made a depression for my screw. So when I put in my screw, it will be nice and flush with the surface. Now, this one will actually be pulled in more, uh, but that is a nice finish. Not always necessary, but here's what I find. When I'm working with kids and building projects around the farm, screws are much more forgiving. If kids make a mistake, you just simply take the screw out. What you should know, if you put the screw back into the same hole, it's very easy to overdrive it and it will sink down deeper. Now, can you use nails? Absolutely, you can use nails. This is a finished nail. Now, if you are using nails, you have very young children. By the way, if you're using screws, you can actually have young children hold this and your hands are over top and they can squeeze and they can actually do the screwing. The hardest part about putting in a screw is getting it started so that you should start that for them. Now, if I was putting in a nail, I would always start the nail for kids. Now, they will be able, and if they hold it a little shorter, they don't have as much power, but they have more control. They will be able to hit it in the rest of the way. Your hands are back from them at that point. Now, when they get all the way down to the bottom, generally kids have trouble getting that last part of the nail in. So you'll need to finish that off for them. But again, this is all about trying to engage kids, engage your family. Uh, and if you have an older uh, girl or boy, you can really, go a long way with projects that you can build. Now, one more thing that I want to point out. If you are making a birdhouse that has a peak, you don't have to miter an angle here so it comes to a perfect point. You can cheat on this part. Just bring one piece up above the other. So much easier to do that way. Now, I think that's about all the helpful hints that we have for you, but I would encourage you to do this. Find what you have inside of your house. Look at the tools that you have and simply supervise your children and give them a chance to explore, look on Pinterest and start a project. And don't be afraid for the project to not come out the way you want it to. That's how you learn.